Welcome to the Women Want Strong Men podcast. I'm your host, Amy Stuttle. I believe it takes a strong man to appreciate a strong woman, and I'm here to bring a unique perspective to empower both sexes. I love talking with health experts, thought leaders, influencers, and people who have insightful information to share with us about our health, our society, and our pursuit for success and prosperity. On today's episode, I have Lindsay Eversmeyer, who is in her first year as the men's head soccer coach at SWIC. Lindsay is also the owner and was the head coach of Fire and Ice, which is a women's semi-pro team that competed in the Women's Premier Soccer League. Her team won three conference championships, two central regional championships, and one national championship. She is also three-time Heartland Conference Coach of the Year. She played collegially at University of Kansas and Harris State University. She also was the first and only woman to play men's professional soccer in the major indoor soccer league for the St. Louis Steamers. In March 2023, she was inducted into the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame. And in her free time, she is the match day analyst for the new MLS St. Louis City Soccer Team. So welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. So I just want to say congratulations, first off, on your new role as the male soccer coach at SWIC, and then also doing some of the match stuff down at St. Louis City. Thank you. Thank you. It's fun. I'm very blessed. So there's very few females that coach male soccer teams. I was looking this up before the podcast, and I think there's only like two or three other females coaching all male teams. And I'm just kind of curious. I'm sure there's some people that feel a certain way about that. And what's your comeback or what's your thoughts when people are like, what's a female doing coaching a male team? I guess my comeback is kind of different than what other people's comebacks could be. But for me, my personal comeback is if a female can't coach a men's team, then why can a man coach a women's team? For me, my experience is like, you know, I don't know a man that's played women's soccer, but I'm a female and I've played men's soccer. So if you want to, if you want to play that game, like I've got more experience than a man does, you know, than most men do. So that's my response to it. I, and I kind of try to ignore that because I feel like it's in a, in a way it's kind of ignorant because things are changing and it's basically teaching. It doesn't matter if it's a sport or not. So if, if a man can teach a woman's sport, then a, a woman can teach a man's sport. It's the way it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you look at, if you look at women's sports, I mean, it's majority males leading those teams and I've played sports my whole life and I try to look back and I think I can only think of maybe one female coach that I've actually had Mm -hmm. throughout my whole time playing sports. But for whatever reason, it seems like when the roles kind of reverse, people seem to have a little bit more of an opinion about it one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, I've I've definitely we had people call into the office at SWIC and even leave messages about it. And it's, you know, I just kind of shake my head. And it's it's they're all they're almost prejudging me, you're not even going to give me a chance to see how good of a job I can do as their coach, you're just automatically going to assume that I can't do it because I'm a different gender. And that just makes no sense to me. So I try to just ignore that stuff. Yeah, since we're on the topic of gender. So there's times where people either get a job or don't get a job based on gender or race. Do you feel like there was ever an opportunity where you either receive something because of being a female or not receive something because of being a female? Or do you think the playing field's always been pretty level for you? Yeah, I, I think for me personally, I've been lucky. I mean, do I know other instances for other people where it's happened? Yes. But for me, I mean, I've always been involved in the men's world. You know, I, I was a, a player and now I'm a coach and now I'm an analyst for, you know, the men's professional team. So I've been kind of lucky with that when it comes to the people who are hiring me. Now, opinions, obviously, it's different, but the people hiring me have really given me a good opportunity. But that's also based off of your experience, too. So I've had a lot of soccer experience and success. So I think they they gave me a fair shot given what my experience was. Yeah, that's awesome. And let's talk about your recruiting experience. So as a female recruiting these male players, have you run into challenges? Or do you feel like you have an edge? Because I just saw that Jalen Hurts signed the biggest what NFL contract there is. And he's got an all female women's management team, which I was like, oh, that's freaking awesome for that to happen. So what do you what's your experience with that? 
Well, once again, like I think when players go and they go to my, you know, go to the website and they view my, my bio and they see all the success that I had, it kind of validates me as a coach. So then I feel like I don't, I don't have any issues. My roster for next fall is already pretty much full. And most of those players, like I didn't have any pushback. They, there was nothing about being female or any of that. It was like, you know, I, I, everybody I contacted gave me the opportunity to give my spiel and they came in and came for a visit and some people went other places and other people, they just thought that Swick was a really good fit. So I haven't personally had anything negative come from me being a female because of my experience. Well, you're also kind of a badass. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, must you are. I family. mean, just, just the way you carry yourself and your demeanor. Must be in the family. It's a family thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, somewhere along the line, Lindsay and I are related. So you're right. Like we kind of thrive in a male dominated situation, maybe. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Our parents Bring are it cousins. On. So your mom and my dad are cousins. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. The, the the Kennedy family tree there. It is. Yeah. Every once in a while, I see you post on social media about parents and their involvement with youth sports, either overstepping at times or or maybe some tips. Let's Let's maybe start on some of the the overstepping that you see and advice that that you would give parents that have children in in youth sports? Well, you know, the whole idea is for it's it's an opportunity for your kids to have fun. You know, I think that's what it's got to be first and foremost. And that goes all the way up to the national teams. If you watch them during their training sessions, they are always having fun. Yes, it's a job. But if you're not having fun, then you're not going to enjoy it. And you're not going to perform. So in order for you for your kids to have fun, you got to let them just play. And it's your time as a parent to just sit back and relax and enjoy those moments of watching your kids be happy. You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes that sometimes parents make is overstepping their boundaries a little bit on the sidelines or even on the way home in the car. So like for me, when I had my club, you know, one of the rules was, you know, like, this is my job. So I don't come to your place of business and yell during your, you know, at your job. So I would prefer for you to not come to my place of business and yell during mine. You know, this is my job. And that that also comes that comes to coaching your kid from the sideline and the referees. When it comes to the referees, for me as a coach, one of my, you know, philosophies is that I'm trying to guide them to be good people, not just good soccer players. So one of those things is all right, well, if you're on the sideline as a parent screaming at the referee when you don't get your way, then what are you teaching your kids? That it's okay when you tell them no, that they can throw a fit. So you're you're developing your kids to do these actions that you don't want them to be doing, you know, but by your example. So I think that parents and the youth sports need to just sit back, relax and enjoy because it's going to go by so fast and then you're going to miss it because you're, you're so worried about all these other things. And then when it comes to the college side, just don't try to live through your kids. Let your, your child or, you know, these young men, now I should say young men or women decide what they want to do based off you know, they're where they're going to get the best education for them that suits them and the best level of soccer where they're going to enjoy it and keep their confidence and have a good time. So leave it up to your, you know, to the kids to to make their decisions and to have their fun. So it's so interesting that you mentioned the confidence because Kipton played soccer up until this year and uh, that Kipton's yeah. my son, for those of you that don't know, but he's 11 now, but this was when he was playing the, the 10U soccer and he quit because of the parents, our own parents, teammates, parents on the sideline screaming nonstop about do this, do that, do this better, our own team. And he just couldn't take it. And like his confidence, you watched it like get smaller and smaller and more timid and then got to the point where he's like, I don't even want the ball. And he was playing at, you know, for his age, like in the higher, Mm -hmm. higher level, he was playing on a good team. And I could not talk him off the ledge of this. And I'm competitive. Mm-hmm. I mean, like we said, this yeah. runs in our family. Like, I am like, let's go. We can fight through this. Don't listen. Like, you've got this. But it's really hard trying to reason with a 10-year-old, you know, that hasn't hit puberty, a boy, like to try to block out these parents that are on your own team. Yeah. I hated it. And so he quit soccer. And it's something like, I hope he doesn't regret it. But that's where we're at yeah. right now. It, that's super sad. But it's something that comes from the top, you know? Like, so I was super up front with my expectations for, for the parents as a sideline and, you know, on the sideline, and you got to keep, hold them accountable. So I told the parents, I'm like, listen, 
if this, if you do this on the sideline, I will walk over and tell you to leave. And if you don't leave, then your kid will not play. So then that's going to be something between the two of you guys. So my, I told them what my expectations were and they knew what it was. And then, you know, you have to follow through with what you tell. It's just like a kid almost, you know, you got to follow through on what you say is going to happen. My sideline was quiet and the referees would always tell me, they're like, man, I never have issues with any of your parents. And I'm like, no, because this is what my expectations were. So if the sideline's like that, then the coach needs to talk to the parents and say, hey, listen, this is unacceptable. And you're making the, the players on the field miserable. You No more talking on the sideline unless it's positive, but no coaching and everything else. You got to leave it up to me. I saw you post something where you're like, listen, if a coach comes to me, like if your child is moving teams or moving up or getting recruited or whatever your situation is that you're dealing with and the parents are crazy, like I'm telling them they're crazy. Or if I get that feedback that you're crazy, it's impacting their opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And that's because, you know, there'll be sometimes where I'm out recruiting and people don't know who I am because I don't necessarily always wear my Swick stuff. I'll be sitting there watching and parents are screaming and yelling and and not just at their teams, kids on their own team, but on the other team. And I'm like, well, I don't want that going on on my sideline. That's a reflection of me and my program. And I don't want that. And I'm not saying that's something that necessarily pushes me from recruiting that player, but it's just something that where I have to have a conversation. So when that parent comes in for their recruiting trip, I let them know, like, this is my expectations from, you know, a coaching standpoint as a college coach, I'm not going to deal with it. And then when it comes to other coaches asking me, like, I'm not going to co-sign, you know, because my reputation and my referrals of players is basically my livelihood. So if you're asking me for a player, I have to be up front and and forthcoming with what their the good things are and what the bad things are. Because if they get there and the coaches are surprised, then that's on me and they may never take my advice again. Coaches just have to be honest. And I think sometimes that's really hard for coaches to be honest. So everybody thinks their kid's the best, right? Everybody's like fighting for those college scholarships, going pro someday. But let's talk about how you actually find your players. And maybe there's people listening that that have have a child that they're trying to tee up for the best opportunities. I think you would prior to us getting on this, you mentioned some websites that you look at and other things. So let's have a discussion around that. Being a, a community college, I try to first go look at schools in the community because I think that's important because obviously, you know, the community pays taxes for the community college. And so they should get the benefits of going to the community college uh, on a scholarship. And then once I exhaust all of those opportunities, then obviously, you know, I try to pull in a few international players or players that aren't from the area. And I do that over certain recruiting sites or sports recruits, there's USA recruit, there's so many different sites, NSCA. So there's different sites I go to and I look up certain things for kids, whether it's positions that I need, and then I watch all their videos. But I like to I like to see players in person and and watch them in a full game because I want to see what in a highlight video they always show you the good things right they never show you all the things they don't highlight the bad things so so then I like to see them in person because I want to see like what they're doing in the good moments what happens in the bad moments what happens when they lose the ball you know that maybe their movement off their positioning so I really like to get to the high school games around here or the club games and go watch and I don't go to certain level of games. Like I'm not just going to the Academy games or ECNL games because I feel like there are diamonds in the rough. That's why there's that expression, right? And just because you're not, you can't afford to play on a top ECNL program or in the Academy or whatever it is, doesn't mean that you're not a good player. It just means that maybe that's not the environment for for you, but you could still be a good player. So I look everywhere. I don't judge by what league you play in. Well, how are those players getting your attention? Is there like a newspaper article or a social media post? Or how are you even kind of picking some of these smaller schools or programs to go look at a player? Well, a lot of the times they'll email me, right? And they'll say, okay, I'm interested. So that makes it easier for me because then I know that someone's interested and I don't want to just waste my time and go look at a specific player when I know there's no way that he's going to come to SWIC. So then when they send me these emails, they typically come with the highlight videos. I see some good things and then I go out and kind of sit on the sideline. One of my favorite places to go, it's called the Metro Cup. So Southwestern Illinois College sponsors 
this event and the women's soccer coach has been in charge of it for years. There's a the boys side of it. And then there's a girl side of it. So during the fall, it's all the guys. And so you can get a bunch of games all at once. And, you know, like kind of one location or multiple locations at the same time during that week. So I can hit a bunch of different schools within that week. So I can see a ton of players. So that's my, my favorite tournament that I go to and they're high school. So they're a whole bunch of different clubs combined. So it's not like a club thing. It's so they're players from, you know, different clubs and different levels. So that's my favorite. But then there's other showcases. They got a Gallagher slo- showcase, Lufu showcase, you know, all the other showcases that I go out to and watch as well. So. So from a leadership perspective, when you're working with a player and trying to make some either corrective behavior, maybe it's attitude wise, maybe it's skill set wise, is there you know, like a technique that you use there to deliver that message? Or you just, you just, you know, shoot them straight and have a very direct conversation with them? Because it seems like, you know, my experience uh, with leading a team, it becomes more difficult, the bigger my staff gets to make corrective behavior. And so I'm curious what your experience with that is. Well, I think first and foremost, I mean, you got to do a little bit of, you know, you kind of build from the bottom, right? So with with sports and with coaching, I have to build this relationship with them, this rapport, you know, to where they trust me and they know that I care about them. Because if you just go out and yell at somebody or tell them, you know, correct them, you haven't tried to build any type of relationship, they're, they're kind of going to push you away. You know, you got to let them know the reason that I'm telling you these things is because I care about you and I'm trying to make you a better person or a better player or whatever it may be. But once you build that, then yeah, it's, it's direct. I don't think that necessarily beating around the bush is the way to do it. If people want to grow, they have to be able to accept criticism. Even me, I mean, like I'm coach, I'm doing this coaching course and I am like getting all this feedback and I'm soaking it all in because I'm open-minded and I want to get better as a coach because that's only going to be better for my players. So I like the straight shooter, just shoot it to me straight. I can take it. Some people may not be able to, but I can take it. And I just know that that feedback is going to make me better. So. No, I totally agree. I mean, one, you're building a culture, right, where you're building that from the ground up where people want to accept that and and want to learn and want to grow. And then, you know, I always say there's a reason why big company CEOs report to a board, right? They're getting feedback, they're working through problems, they're getting advice, whatever it may be. So it doesn't matter what level you're at in the game or in an organization, you have to be open to accepting feedback or, I mean, what's the point, right? We're trying to better ourselves, the organization, in our case, you know, patient experiences, in your case, wins and losses. So, but I do find, especially with younger newer staff, it it is a little bit more of an art. And I don't know if it's a generational thing, but I'm with you. I just always like the direct feedback, but that's not the case for everybody. No, it's not. And I found this out with coaching girls. You got to tell them like a few things that they do good first to make them feel good about themselves before you come back and say something, but this is something you need to work on, which is fine. You know, at least I know that going into it, but with the guys, I love the fact that I can just say, hey, you need to do this. And they all, they're just like, okay, coach, you got it. And then that's it. And then six months later, they're not bringing it up and be like, you remember that time you yelled at me? So it's, it's easier with that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it transcends even at to the highest level because I'm friends with Tony LaRussa, uh, which you, you probably know. And I had him on the podcast and he calls it the pat, pop, pat. So he's like, you pat, good, good, good. And then you pop with the bad, you know, what they need to work on and then you pat them up again and then you you kind of send them off. But we also recently talked about, because I talked to him about some of these things as my team's growing and he talks about his experience like with the fungo, like out when he's just walking around the field and he was having more informal conversations with his players about things that he might want to address or work on versus like always calling a meeting because he felt like that might put them onto the defensive. So when you're doing the corrective behavior, you just calling it out in practice or an informal conversation. Are are you having like a sit down with them with like a coaching staff? I do a little bit of everything. So in the beginning of the season, I typically have like an introductory meeting because with the JUCO level, I got players coming in and out every other year. So it's like, I constantly have new people and I need to get to know them quickly as individuals. So I always do like an in-person meeting and it's really just about like, hey, tell me about what your expectations are, what the things you need to work on, things you need help with, blah, blah, blah. And then during the season, as we go, 
if we're in a training session where it's something about tactics or something like that during during the session, you got to stop it and kind of point it out. But you do you can do it in a nice way. And then the corrective stuff. Yeah, that's just something where, hey, you know, you pull them aside real quick. And just say this, you know, like you do really, you do this really well, but I need you to do this, this, and this. Can you try this for me? Okay. Yeah, great. Go ahead. Go on back out there and let's try it again. Because I feel like some players can take criticism publicly. And then there's some that would want you to say it kind of in quiet, you know, so you got to get to know the person that you're talking to before you can deliver those things. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're doing some work with St. Louis city soccer now. What's the official title? What's your official title there? It's match day analyst. Okay. So what does a day look like there? You show up prior to the game and do what? So usually it's a, I get there a few hours before the game, but we always try to do like a run through me and the host. Her name's Kristen Carver. She's amazing. So we do a run through, we go over our lines and then about 630 is when like the pregame stuff starts. So then I have three different bits that I come in before the game and I talk about the goalkeepers. So I compare the two of them. Then I talk about the player to watch. So I pick a player, you know, earlier that week, usually it's after the, the game the week before. And I'm like, I want to watch this player this time. And then I do um, the ultra facts of the match. So um, then I talk about three facts of the match, whether it's, you know, head to head stuff with the team or stuff that the team is leading in goals, winning, whatever league facts or whatever. At halftime, I typically talk about what's gone on in the the first half, you know, what stood out to me, what they need to continue doing, like little things like that. So I don't do a, a whole bunch of stuff, but I do enough that I'm just like, I love being a part of it. It's amazing. Like for those people that haven't been out to a game, you got to get out there. The environment is insane. It's a, it's awesome. Yeah. There's nothing better than St. Louis fans, right? Isn't it amazing? I mean, even down to like watching them with the Battle Hawks. I mean, St. Louis shows up for their sports team and that the St. Louis City park is amazing and it's a great atmosphere. And yeah, if you haven't been, you definitely have to go. So what excites you most about what you've seen about the St. Louis team? I mean, they've performed great as a new club. And what are you seeing energy wise from that group of guys? Well, my favorite part is, as I love being an underdog, I've been an underdog so many times in my life and seen underdog teams that have persevered. I love a good underdog. And there was Nothing more than St. Louis City being an underdog this season with everybody's predictions all across the United States, you know? So I love that people thought that we weren't going to win a game this season. And now we're at the top of the table for not just the Western Conference, but for all of MLS soccer, which is crazy. So this has been like my favorite part is proving people wrong. And because I feel like this, this relates to me because everything I've done in my life, I feel like it's because someone has told me I can't do it. And I'm the type where if you tell me no, I'm like, just watch me then. Okay, let me show you what I can do. And I feel like that's what St. Louis <laughs> City is doing right now. They're, they're incredible. I love watching them. Yeah, from last to first. I mean, it's freaking amazing. I love it. Yeah. Who's your favorite player or who who's who's the player that you're most intrigued by oh boy I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not oh that's gonna be that's tough <laughs> yeah I'm like I don't know if I want to put myself in that boat but you know I I'll just say like I was a I was a <laughs> I was a forward growing up so I'm a striker so I typically <laughs> tend to kind of lean towards the strikers so you know that's Joao Klaus and the Nico Giochini like those two players because they're the attacking players are my favorite to watch because I can relate to that you know what I mean but then we have Tim Parker in the defense has been great. And obviously our goalkeeper, Roman Berkey, I love watching him play. Edward Leuven in the midfield has been great. Stroud. I mean, there's there's so many good players that it's it's hard to pick just one, but I tend to gravitate towards strikers because that's the position I played. So that's my, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're staying politically correct on that one. That's fine. Uh, I'll let you have it. Why do you think they're performing so well? I mean, besides the fact of being an underdog, like what are you seeing on the field and as far as like working together and their skill set? I mean, what's getting them to where they're at right now? Well, I think it's multiple factors. You know, Lutz and, and Bradley have come up with a system that they want to play, and it's a, a style that's energy drink soccer. And they're staying consistent with that. And when there's consistency, you know, that's that's key. Not to mention that this team, these players all agreed to come in way before 
their first season was even there. So they've been training together for a long time. So they were prepared coming into the season. It's not like, hey, let's let's get an MLS expansion team in six months you have to prepare. They pr- they had plenty of time prepared. And they have been consistent with how their style of play has been. And, and as individual players, you can tell they're all committed to the process. And that's what it is. It's a process. And I think that's why they continue to be successful is they keep sticking to their guns and the whole idea of it. And it just continues to work. So for us, it's like, well, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So as long as you keep, as they keep playing the way they're playing, then that's, and they keep having success, why change anything? So I just feel like it's, it's multiple things. And what about the high schooler? The high schooler on the team. I mean, how does that work? I mean, I know he he goes to class, believe it or not, in the mornings is what I heard. So yeah, Miguel Perez, I, I love this, okay? Because he was a kid that they found in, they say, the middle of the boonies, like out in the country, like way, way out. It wasn't like they found him in the city. They picked him up somewhere else. And it just goes to show that you can find those diamonds in the rough, you know? Like I said earlier, I think this is incredible for him and incredible for youth players to see like, oh my gosh, there's a chance for me to get seen at the high school level. So I need to make sure that I'm performing at all times and doing my best. And you never know what could happen, right? So I think that's great. I'm, I'm very excited and happy for him. Yeah, I'm like, wow, what an incredible experience for him. And then Monday show back up to school and go to class like everybody else. It's pretty insane experience for him and his family, I'm sure. So you mentioned that you're in a coaching course currently. Mm -hmm. Are there any leadership books that you read or that you would recommend or podcasts that you listen to or what on that front would you recommend? This sounds so bad. So I am not a fan of reading. (laughs) I've never been big big on books. (laughs) So what I want, I typically follow coaches. Everybody asks me, who's your favorite European team? And I'm like, I I just love watching soccer in general because there's so many different styles of plays because there's so many different coaches. So my favorite coach is, um, he coaches Liverpool. It's Jurgen Klopp. So I tend to, to watch training sessions on YouTube of how they do their training sessions. So I, I'm a visual learner. So I could read something in a book, but until I see it, it's hard for me to grasp. So I love watching stuff and listening. I do have a book that is good for youth that I assigned for my team one time and it was a a confidence building thing. And it's called Everything Your Coach Wanted to Tell You But You Were a Girl. And it's by Dan Blank. So it's basically about how coaches, male coaches, never really said exactly the things that you needed to hear because you're a female. And then it talks about all the ways that you have to kind of self-motivate yourself to be successful. So I love that book. So Everything Your Coach Never Told You Because You're a Girl by Dan Blank is one of my favorite reading materials for youth. I've never heard of that book, but I feel like I I would uh, enjoy that read. Mm-hmm. So you wore a female on an all-male soccer team. I mean, I mentioned that in your bio, but we haven't talked about it yet. So Did you feel like the players treated you like an equal or like the competitors treated you as an equal? Or was it like this, like more timid environment or what was going on there? That's tough. I feel like as far as my across the league, no one really said anything. The players that is negative to me, they were pretty accepting and very nice. I feel like on my team, you know, half the team was okay with it because they knew why I was there. And then the other half had didn't want to have anything to do with me for that. I shouldn't even say half. It was a little less than it was less than half. So it was just a few players. But you know, the whole reason that I started, I, I really went out and tried out for that team was not just to try to prove that I could play with the men's team, but, but was to show that there were no options for women. So it was to bring awareness for that. So where do you expect women who want to play competitively and professionally to play at? There's no options. Nobody is stepped up to play, but there's all these opportunities for guys to play. So, and I had to, it's not like they just threw me on the team. Like I had to go out and, and try out too. So it was rough. That was a very rough time. I know people probably think, oh man, this was easy. It must have been so fun for her. No, it, it was harder more than it was fun. It taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. So I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to do it. But yeah, it was good. So do you think that women should be able to play on men's sports teams? Like if there was a girl good enough to play on a on a male soccer club, do you think that should be allowed? 
I think women playing on on men's teams, well, now there's plenty of opportunities. You know what I'm saying? So there's a women's professional team and there's women's national team. So there's there's plenty of opportunities. If you think that you, if you go out and you play in the women's, in a women's professional league, and you are just so far above everyone, which I haven't really seen any player be like that in a while. If you feel like that's not what challenges you and you need more than to play in a women's professional league, then by all means, go try out. I don't feel like it should be given. I feel like it's something that has to be earned. So if you feel like you you are just way too good to play for the women's team, everybody can see it. You're just dribbling through everybody and scoring 10 goals a game. By all means, feel free to go try out for the men's team. But I mean, I, I don't. I think you should give the women's league a chance first because we got to grow the women's side of the game. There's that too, you know. Yeah, yeah, a good response. Well, I appreciate your time today. I know you have a practice here coming up, so thank you for being on the show, Lindsay. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was good talking to you. 